webinar series. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce established the Canadian Business Resilience Network to bring together a vast network of Chambers of Commerce, Boards of Trade and leading business associations to help the business community prepare, preserve and to ultimately prosper through COVID-19. This webinar series is one of many tools and supports coming in line from the CBRN to support Canadian business uh, businesses' continuity efforts. This series and other tool, tools are made possible by our important CBRN partners, including KPMG. I am Patrick Gill, the Senior Director of Tax and Financial Policy for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and I will be your moderator today. But you're not here to see me, so allow me uh, to uh, introduce you with great pleasure to KPMG Deal Advisory Partners, Peter Graham and Damien Peluso. Peter has over 25. Federalists are doing their best, but it's not like the uh, His domestic and European experience covers uh, many sectors, including consumer products, media entertainment, distribution, and retail. Yep. Uh, and Damien himself has over 19 years in both M&A and due diligence advisory, covering over 200 transactions globally. Damien's focus is in corporate and private equity, providing a range of due diligence uh, forecasting services. Both Peter and Damien are with us today because we're not the only, because we, we know that uh, people are not, are not the only things being kept apart. Canadian dealmakers themselves have seen a, a significant drop in uh, major deals uh, since mid-March. This observation has been backed up by recent hard data from the Canadian Chamber's data project with Statistics Canada. According to our recently released Canadian survey on business conditions, 11% of large to mid-range companies that answered the survey have chosen to postpone major deals for the time being. To help us understand what's happening behind the scenes, Peter and Graham, uh, sorry, uh, P Peter and Damien will uh, take approximately 10 to 15 minutes to share some insights for you through a presentation. Following their presentation, I'll ask them in some important questions that are on the top mind of myself and my other policy uh, colleagues. After that, we'll focus the rest of our time today to address your questions, which you will hopefully be posting on the Slido website, which can be accessed at the bottom of your registration confirmation email. I do ask and remind everyone to uh, mute their lines during this time, and I turn it over to Peter and Damien uh, for their insightful presentation. Patrick, I'm going to kick it off. Um, and then I'll throw it over to Peter and we'll go back and forth on a lot of these things. Our, our goal today is to get through um, a few slides that should be coming up uh, shortly. Uh, they are, there they are now. Um, talk a bit about the, you know, the environment today as a result of COVID-19. And then we'll get into the impact uh, COVID-19 has had on M&A and where we think M&A will be post-COVID-19. So if you look at this first slide that we have up, um talking a bit about uh you know there's different recovery scenarios right so there's different curves as you see here there's the v u the long u and the w um it, the the v curve is really it's a short-term business disturbance uh, through q q2 of 2020 strong recovery thereafter and then there'll be some global trade pickup quickly following a, a peak in the impact or return to previous economic levels a smoother curve as you can see uh, there will be business disturbances which will remain through q2 and q3 of 2020 with recovery we're estimating beginning in q4 of 2020 to the long u which is a slower recovery short term and sustained disturbances which will lead to longer market correction and then finally we get into the w which is much more erratic uh, first wave within the, the first and second quarters Again, short-term disturbances um, subside in Q2 2020, and then we get into the first real quick wave of recovery near previous economic levels. The condition, sorry, cannot sustain the rebound, and then there'll be a more gradual recovery, which we believe will begin towards the end of 2020 and through 2021. 
I'm going to ask Peter now to talk a bit about uh, the likely scenarios for each of the sectors. Thanks, Damien. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so what we have here is it's planning for the recovery. Okay, so as we emerge out of um, the COVID lockdown and uh, as, we, as we get to recovery for all these industries, what we have here is plotted in, a, in, a, in four quadrants. So if we look at the y-axis, you have the degree of change that's expected to the industry or its, its demand pattern or value chain, so a high degree and a low degree. And on the x-axis, you have the pace of recovery. Um, slow on the left to fast on the right. So if we go to the upper right, these, these are the beneficial sectors. These are the industry sectors where there's going to be a surge. And we can see, right, the online retail story, um, you know, that has really proven effective in this environment. Um, food delivery, telehealth, uh, those types of things, streaming media, um, a, a big surge, a change in the fundamental um, economics of the sector uh, to the positive. So that, that's, that's the sector to watch, the fast pace of change. Um, opposite on the top left is the hard reset. Um, okay, so it's like airlines, hotels, restaurants, uh, China, who's a few months ahead of us on this recovery. Uh, we've seen some very significant drops in terms of uh, people going back to restaurants and flights and so on. Bottom left, you have the sectors that uh, their perspective, they're going to have to transform to reemerge. Uh, travel and leisure, uh, the sanitary measures required in those types of sectors. And then at the bottom right, um, sort of modified business as usual. Um, they can come back, not much change needed. Uh, those are the types of sectors. So when we, when we look at these quadrants, with the pace of everything that we've witnessed over the past two and a half months, I mean, valuations need to adjust. Uh, industry, industry sector demand forecasts need to adjust. All the planning needs to adjust. Um, there's going to be changes in the com competition environment. There's going to be some competitors failing in some of the distressed sectors. Uh, the leaders that come out of this, do they have the financial capacity to grow? Um, will there be consolidation? Uh, on, a, on a micro level, there's going to be restructuring needed. Um, this, these are, this is the framework that we're looking at in order to help our clients and help, help our clients think about the recovery. And we'll go to the next slide. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm going to talk about this next slide here, which gets into, um, you know, the different phases. Uh, you know, all, all companies are going to experience short and long-term macroeconomic conditions. But their move through these different phases is going to be highly influenced by the type of sector in. And the four phases we're talking about is reaction, which we've which we've gone through, uh, resilience, which we're we're, we're in here in, in it now, then recovery and new reality. In the reaction phase, which we all went through, our professional and personal lives rapidly and simultaneously were disrupted. There was you know the corporate capital market sell-off, the lockdown, and the immediate liquidity crisis for businesses and individuals. Now we're getting into the resilience stage, um, which is, you know, the panic mode uh, behavior seems to be uh, subsiding. And controls loosen as the virus spread is seen to be contained uh, or, and or controlled. Uh, consumer demand still is constrained by the lost wages investment losses and recessionary fears. The global supply chains are slowly starting to recover, or we're, ho we're hoping that to see that recovery come on. Then we get into the recovery stage, which we think is coming next here in Canada. Capital projects begin to scale and, and hiring is gonna come back. Sentiment and consumption improves as jobs are created or come back. Uh, investment trends, uh, tend to be positive and as our anxiety passes, you know, positive climate impacts 
An early indication of new, a new normal will, will start to emerge as certain pre-COVID stores struggle to recover. And into the new reality, which no one really knows what that's going to be. But we, we think it's gonna, there's gonna be a new normal. And as learned behaviors through all these other three phases uh, have been experienced, the nature interaction we all know is gonna likely be different, whether it's communication, travel, education. Uh, mig migration towards mega city levels uh, will level off, sorry, as remote connectivity proves viable. And then what we all are thinking, the new baby boom among millennials, redefine their spending priorities and their habits. Into now a bit about, so that's a bit about what has happened, what we think has happened through all the industries, uh, the, the markets, uh, and, and the impact COVID-19 has had and will likely have. Now we're gonna get into the focus of this presentation, which is what has, how has COVID-19 impacted uh, M&A activity and where do we think uh, M&A activity will be post COVID-19. We're going to, Peter and I are going to have a conversation over this. There's not going to be any slides, but we'll, we'll be open right after this to questions. So I'm going to throw it back to Peter to talk a bit about how COVID-19 has impacted M&A. Okay, great. So a, as we go through this, if we can encourage all the participants, go on the, the Slido um, website and then you can put in your, your question. And we're gonna to try to deal with these questions as we go through. Um, Damien and I exclusively focus on providing deal advice to our clients. Um, in mid-March, when, when this all hit in Canada, you know, we were in, engaged in many, proje many projects, both on the buy side and the sell side on behalf of clients. And these clients are our privately owned businesses in Canada, their private equity funds, uh, their foreign investors investing into Canada. Um, probably two thirds of the projects that we were on were sort of halted. Um, the environment became too uncertain uh, to make it worth to continue. You know, bidders, it had, if they hadn't signed an agreement or anything, they're like, why would we, why would we continue right now? The sellers knew that uh, in the immediate term, perhaps their, the value that they would get would, would drop. So many, many processes halted. Um, but not cancel, on hold is the way that we've, we've described this. Um, lots of sell side projects, which may have been scheduled to come to market this summer in the fall. Many of those are on hold, uh, looking at the the environmental conditions and see if it makes sense. Uh, you know, coming into this, the, the M&A activity was still pretty healthy. Uh, multiples were still high. There was a high degree of confidence. Um, things were going well, but the the, the pace and the the significance of the disrupt, disruption was was I, we're not going to say and well, it's unprecedented because you know we're not used to a pandemic. But if I think back in 20 years, you know, this is we had the dot-com bubble, as far as I've been involved in M&A. You had the dot-com bubble, which crashed valuations. 18 months later, we had 9-11. Um, and that was not just, you know, from worldwide perspective, that was not just an airline uh, sector event. Uh, I was working in Europe at that time, and we had about a six-month period where companies just deferred decision-making to see where, where the economy was going, where investment was going, globalization was going. And then, of course, the financial collapse, um, which uh, seized up the debt markets in eight and nine, and that, uh, that 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 had the big impact on the on the valuations. Um, but what's different here is that we have a lot of cash on balance sheets. There's uh, piles of capital and private capital, uh, private equity. We have some corporations that are very well capitalized. Um, we have a relatively low interest rate environment, although the uh, the pricing on many of the the loans and capital providers are have, have increased over the last two months. Um, but let's not forget that private equity is still in a very, very strong position. Um, they're very opportunistic. Um, what we see now is not just 
equity deals. We see uh, a willingness to perhaps uh, take some investments in the form of convertible debt or other types of, uh, of ways of just deploying their capital in unique ways. Um, as I said earlier, lots of uh, the pace of change is so great that there's a, there's a continual reevaluation re of, of the different sectors and different companies. Um, in our deal advisory group, we have a restructuring practice. Um, these environmental conditions are going to force a lot of uh, restructuring activities. Uh, it's early days. Canadian, if you think of Canadian banks and their special loans groups, I mean, they wouldn't, they don't have capacity to handle tens of thousands of, of, of customers uh, requiring immediate uh, service. What we see is a lot of leniency. Uh, the common thing that we've seen is a waiver of perhaps covenant uh, restrictions in the shorter term, one quarter, two quarter. Um, and we've got uh, we're, conf we're we're in a bit of a lull right now, but we do see over the next year or so there is going to be a big resurgence in M&A activity. You're going to have the return um, of the transactions that were about to come to market a few months ago, and then you're also going to have the forced restructuring uh, as the companies in specific sectors are required to perhaps sell that non-core division, raise that extra bit of capital. Uh, and then, to, you know, if there are strategic planning says that this particular division is no longer a part of our organization, then, you know, there's going to be additional, uh, there's going to be additional transaction activity. And those who are prepared for this are going to be uh, able to get in front of the pack. Um, Damien, do you want to like, yeah, take sure. Thanks, further? Yeah. Um, you can hear me right Yeah. So uh, we're looking now at post pandemic and M and a, right? I mean, economies are still are in recession. They'll likely still be in recession. Um, you know, the M and a, M and a activity, as Peter said, will pick up again. Uh, you know, we wish we knew how quickly that will happen, but we think that due to cash flow comeback uncertainties, physical distancing, slow down uncertainties. Buyers and banks will potentially be cautious um, in, in you know, looking at deals and, and lending to deals. You know, we, we also believe that there's likely gonna be a, a second wave and as most experts, a second wave of pandemic, which is gonna impact the M&A activity. Multiples were fairly high pre-COVID-19, will likely not be at the same levels as pre-COVID-19 in most industries. Overall, the very seller-friendly period is presumably over. Cash flow will be more than king post-COVID-19. We can't stress enough how cash is going to be king. Investors will, with an appetite for deals, with lower leverage and willingness to pay for some synergies, will have the advantage with cash on their balance sheet. We've heard, of, we've heard from some clients, as mentioned, that have relatively strong balance sheets that they might choose to follow certain business strategies uh, to, to the detriment of their more distressed competitors. Succession M&A activity will likely be higher than pre-COVID-19 as principals and owners will not want to experience another pandemic without being self-sufficient. So we all know that you know, succession is going, was going to drive the M&A activity in Canada over the next four or five years, we think it's gonna be even a stronger influence in driving that activity. Private equity, as Peter said, will still have lots of cash and will aggressively be looking for opportunities, but the shift in risk perception and higher uncertainty will mean lower valuations for a lot of industries. Interest rates, we believe, will continue to be low and have demonstrated to be low, uh, and banks are gonna be very supportive, and this will support m and activity as it has in the past. Potential buyers and lenders we believe will do, and we're seeing that as well, will do more due diligence before approaching a deal, one resulting in longer processes. Buyers will likely focus on deals that support their current operations, not looking for non-core type investments, rat, uh, and, still, and this is still gonna be good for m, m They're just gonna be more focused. 
The key is in understanding what normal level of EBITDA as a result of COVID-19 during and post, and this will require more rigorous due diligence and assistance from advisors who have the M&A experience. M&A supply and demand. We think that demand will still be higher than supply, stronger businesses coming out of this and lower interest rates. However, we do think more equity put into deals. The structure of deals will likely change. We believe there's going to be more earnouts and more VTBs should be expected. The industries, as Peter has touched on, there's certain industries like manufacturing related to essential services, transportation, food and agri, e-commerce related businesses, healthcare, infrastructure, and retail distribution will likely be the most active in the early days of post-COVID-19 M&A environment. You know, the, the uh, China's coming, come, you know, we're the first ones and now they're coming out of it. What type of investment are they going to have? Will it be ramped up? Will North America still sell to some of the Asian uh, business businesses? Will the government look to this? Are there going to be other foreign investments? These are all questions that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about now in the M&A world and how that's going to impact uh, M&A activity post-COVID-19. Uh, you know, how will the government react to this? Will they place any restrictions on foreign direct investments and trade to protect national interests? We believe that Canadian manufacturing activity and MLA will likely grow post-COVID-19 in North America, assuming there will be some shortening of supply chains. Chains are fragile today, and business should re really think about the cost, risk, benefit of having reliance on key vendors overseas. We'll be looking to more home uh, uh, suppliers here in North America to support us. In the end, the conclusion is that m and will be back. It may take a little time to get started. It starts, it will be very active. And in general, valuations will not be as high as pre-COVID-19. Still be lots of good deals to be made. We're gonna throw it now back to Patrick, who's gonna start the Q&A for Peter and I, um, and we're looking forward to answering those questions. Great, thank you so much, Damien, and do appreciate that. Uh, really interesting presentation. And the first question that comes to mind is, uh, as you were talking about uh, how uh, deals will be plentiful uh, across the North American perspective, uh, how do Canadian companies, um, how might they take advantage of or begin looking for opportunities post-COVID-19? Um, uh, and what do you think might be the best time for them to buy? Uh, is it, do they start planning now? Uh, if, if they think they have the cash uh, or the partners uh, to do so? I'll take a first stab at that. Um, I, think, I think, you know, the answer first one, how does a company look for opportunities post COVID-19? I think talking to restructuring groups that, like we have here at KPMG, you know, talking to their various advisors because they'll be linked in to the, to the deals and to the companies. I think focusing on similar businesses to your own, um, you know, where you can add synergies and support the comeback for businesses with your own industry experience, I think is going to be key. I think this is where you're going to look for opportunities. And also, as we mentioned, looking for succession, uh, looking for succession issues in businesses, talking to people who are going through succession. I think that's going to be key. Peter, you want to touch on that? Yeah, if I could add. So, I mean, nobody can predict the bottom. Um, but you know, to to do a, a merger and acquisition transaction, whether it be a divestiture of a, of a division or acquisition for growth, you know, these are serious decisions. They have to be planned, and the good news is, is they're rationalized over the long term. So if you miss the bottom and you overpay a little bit, you know, it's not the biggest disaster. It's a long term decision you're you're making. Um, and I would just say have some discipline in the planning for that. Um, do your homework. Uh, if you're attacking a new market, do your do your due diligence on that market. Uh, talk to the advisors that have experience in that market and that geography. Um, and uh, ensure that the rationale for your decision is is well founded. And 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 you know do some scenario analyses and. Um, if it's for the long term, ensure that it's uh, it's well thought out. And Patrick, do you, do you, your second you know, point to that is when do you think the best time to buy? Uh, I think that 
uh, I think the, the most, one of the most important things is first to look at your own business to see when is the best time for you to buy. The best time is when someone can support and has the right tools to properly integrate uh, the asset that they're looking to buy. And likely the best deals will come early on, as Peter said, in, in the post-COVID-19 time. Very much. And so now, again, looking sort of at a North American base, uh, perspective, even broader, uh, specifically inbound foreign investment post-COVID-19, can you give some insights on, on your thought of how active foreign investment will be and, and very sensitive, uh, you know, what uh, my policy and uh, colleagues and I are thinking about in this po post COVID period is that uh, with the landscape of business enterprises there, you know, ultimately you could, you could break down it into uh, herbivores and carnivores. And so uh, from an a North American perspective, who's going to be the uh, carnivores, who are going to be the herbivores and who's going to get gobbled up. Okay. I'll, I'll start that one off. Um, uh, you know, what we've seen over the last number of years, um, I can speak to some European investors. I've got a number of clients in, in Europe and France in particular. Um, they were operating in a very low growth environment for the last number of years. Um, many of their, their industrial conglomerates uh, in Europe, and this is true for, for Germany as well, but very well capitalized balance sheets and there are a tremendous number of extremely large privately owned um, businesses i dealt with one in particular and they had no debt um and they were coming to north america and you know a, a full cash transaction um a strategic competitor who could realize synergies, you know, they could make a very compelling case to acquire the Canadian business. Um, they, were, they were strategic, they had done their homework, they had identified family owned businesses where there were very few numbers of people that they had to negotiate with. Um, they're coming, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're coming at us, uh, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and it really depends on the succession plan of the, the privately owned business. You know, do you want, do you have that next generation of family members that wants to take over the business? Do you want them still involved? Um, but Patrick, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. You know, we, we, you know, over many years you have the hollowing out of Canadian businesses. I think it's going both directions. Of course, I'm not talking about sensitive things like technologies or cultural things or agriculture. I'm just talking about, um, you know, industrial businesses, manufacturing businesses, businesses where I don't think there's necessarily a, a political uh, angle to the decision to allow a foreign acquisition. And also if it's privately owned, you know, it's, it's under the control of the, uh, of the seller, whether you sell or who you sell to. Great. Great to know. Thank you very much. Um, I think the last question uh, I have in my mind before turning things over to, to the folks on the call, uh, and I do encourage you to take the time and to pose your questions on Slido, and uh, Peter and Damien will get to them in just a moment. But my last question for you, I think, is, uh, uh, you know, so, so lots of businesses right now trying to figure out um, going forward from from a debt financing perspective um can you talk to them about how they might want to uh reapproach renegotiating bank loads loans during this period or or should they wait a little bit longer uh i mean some com companies certainly don't have choices uh, right now they they need the cash uh but uh, but what are your thoughts on that front uh damien i'll tell start off maybe go ahead peter um sure. yeah so uh, renegotiating a bank loan now, it's uh, probably not the right time. Um, as I indicated earlier, there's, it's almost damage control. You have the special loans group who are dealing with urgent situations right now. If you don't have to renegotiate and you approach them right now, I'm not sure um, what type of a deal you're going to get. Uh, if, if you get a short-term deal, it doesn't meet your objective anyway. We know that their their pricing has gone up. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure now is the time unless there's a, a, a short-term need for capital. Um, Damien, have you had a, a recent experience with this? Yeah, I, I think, I think that right now what Peter and I are seeing is that, you know, the banks are being 
very, very supportive, or the lenders in general. Um, you know, they're all stakeholders in all in these businesses. So, you know, they're they're not there isn't going to be like, uh, you know, a whole influx of uh, companies going under because they're gonna they're gonna want to support. I think what's very important and what we're seeing a lot of is communication making sure that you communicate with your stakeholders, which includes the banks and your lenders, of where you are during COVID-19, what you're going through, have a plan in place, um, you know, make sure that your cash flow projections are up to date, stay top of mind in terms of what's going on with other, other stakeholders, as well as, and I mean, what I mean by that, your clients and your suppliers, government as well, right? You want to make sure that you, you take advantage of some of the scenarios that are out there, some of the subsidies and programs. But again, I want to stress, I can't stress enough how important it is to keep the lenders and the banks apprised of where you are in this process and how you're going to come out, out of it. The first thing we do with our clients is make sure they have the appropriate cash flows and budgets in place, uh, you know, during COVID-19 and post COVID-19 and what their plan is. And the banks, again, uh, have been very supportive and they listen, they're there to help. They're not there to hurt. That's great. Thanks guys. Okay. Let's uh, turn it over to Slido right now because we want to hear um, the many questions that, uh, that we're getting on, on the system and please uh, feel free to post and we'll get to them very soon. And if you like a specific question uh, on the Slido website, uh, just uh, up click it and we'll get to it that much faster. Okay. So first off the top, uh, this isn't from anyone in particular, it seems. Um, so it says they've been approached. Uh, by a U.S. competitor to acquire their business. Uh, yeah, they're looking to know how, how do they know if they're getting a fair price, and they're also following up to see, you know, what are their options for looking for sort of a Canadian partner um, um, as a counterbalance. Okay, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the first uh, stab at this. Uh, first thing, as a professional, talk to a professional. Um, you know, you want to make sure uh, that you've got, all, you know, you're properly protected, and they and a professional could tell you what you know a fair price um, it really is in today's world, which is going to be very difficult because, we, as Peter said originally, you know we've never been through something like this. We've been through different different times that have impacted M and A, but not not to this extent. Um, you know, our for example, our corporate finance group can provide you know you and other company with ranges of what your business is worth today and what, what what it likely be be worth in the few, you know post covid-19 you know who potential buyers are we also i would also recommend that you keep on top of transactions in your industries know what's going on you know you know let have an understanding of what multiples are what people are paying i think that you know there's going to be some kind of adjustment when you do valuations for companies as a result of covid-19 but again get out there and talk to your professionals Peter, anything to add there? Yeah, so typical thing. So a U.S. competitor comes in, perhaps they gave you a price. Um, in an uncertain environment like we're in right now, what we see more often is um, share deals, um, where just a relative valuation has to be discussed. Uh, they're, they're a little less risky than cash deals. Um, but uh, something you could do is, so you, you think of the, the uh, profile of that US, well, we say it's a competitor. So that means that they might be able to extract synergies from this deal. Um, larger could be cheaper. Um, they're squashing a competitor. Perhaps there's some revenue synergies. When we say that, that usually means perhaps you can uh, increase price a little on your combined products. Um, how do you know the price is fair? Well. You know, uh, an aggressive reaction would be, well, we're not happy with the price. We want 10% more. Uh, the purchaser says, the bidder says no. Well, what you could do is actually engage a full auction process and, and invite them to join the auction and see if you can get a better price from someone else. Uh, another alternative uh, could be if they're not willing to give you that extra price up front, maybe construct a pricing structure that might include an earnout uh, that says, hey, if I, if I achieve my earnings forecast over the next two years, then I get an additional 10% on top of what you're offering. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say, how do you know the price is fair? The only real way to know the price is fair is if you run an auction and you have many, many bidders that come in and they have different profiles. 
uh, private equity funds, you know, they have the advantage of often having a higher leverage uh, and therefore they can accept uh, lower returns um, and or well, they can get higher returns, but their equity returns um, will be different, whereas the the competitor gets synergies. So it, it's a it's a play between those two profiles. But yeah, very interesting. That's, if you're getting a, a approached by a U.S. competitor now, yeah, that's uh, uh, that's a good question. So uh, do you know what? I'll, I'll, whoever posted that, I'll I'll uh, let the let them approach you guys afterwards if they're trying to figure out if the price is a is a good one. Yeah. I know your contact information will be uh, shared in your presentation uh, with okay. everyone on the call later. So uh, let's get to the next question, and we're starting to get quite a few, so we'll try to keep it. Uh, uh, nice and tight. We're up here. Some uh, Meg has a question saying, "Do you foresee a spike in demand for new forms of operation and transitions into structures, nonprofits, co-ops, social enterprises, public sector?" All right, uh, Peter, Damien, who wants to take this? So, so I think that's a very interesting one. Um, so, perhaps in the immediate term, what we've experienced in the pandemic, uh, you know. Additional services, if they don't, doesn't make sense to be uh, to provide those services in the private market. Maybe they will move toward nonprofits. Um, I, I'm not an expert at all in senior care, but I think we've exposed some some weaknesses in our in our senior care systems. Maybe that needs to be explored a little bit. Um, but the spike in M&A demand. Uh, having a direct relationship with these, I'd, I'd have to explore that a little more. That's a, an interesting concept. Give me an answer. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Peter. I, I think when when I you know when I first saw this question, um, I see new structures. I think I was thinking about uh, the only new structures I'm thinking about is the type of investment they make. Uh, you know, whether it's private equity in terms of whether it's uh, you know equity investments or leveraging it. Very, uh, we're going to look into this one and get back to you. All right, perfect. Uh, Meg, I hope that uh, that addressed uh, your question, but it, uh, if not, uh, you can follow up with these guys afterwards. Okay, it looks like we have another question and probably from one of my colleagues on the on the Chamber Policy team. Is M&A fast, a faster way to scale and expand internationally? I know there's been a lot of focus uh, these yeah. days on scaling Canadian enterprise. Uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think, I think uh, going into any new market, um, uh, you know, growth through acquisition is is the quickest way. Uh, uh, we we believe, and I, and I think it's the easiest way to you know to start in your growth strategy, for sure. Um, as well, uh, in terms of getting your profitability to the levels uh, where you want to you know get to the next uh, move in your in your strategy, whether it's you know going public or selling it off. I think the the bolt-ons getting into new countries. New customers, I think the easiest way and fastest way is definitely uh, doing international expansion or just acquisitions in general. Uh, whether it, you want to grow, uh, I think in, through acquisition is the quickest and easiest way. Perfect. Good. So more of a more of a uh, you can uh, buy a whole bunch of customers at once versus going after one one sale at a time sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. Next one. We have another anonymous question. No, oh, everyone's being shy today. My company has never really had any discipline with regards uh, to setting up financial budgets and business planning. Uh, where do we start? Um, good question. So, but you know, I will say, don't feel too badly because even if you had a budget, it probably didn't serve you very well over the last <laughs> uh, month or two. Um, but no, it, it's good financial discipline. I think every every company should should have at least a one month or two month cash flow. Uh, you don't want to negotiate with your banks uh, after there's a crisis situation. If you have to show that you, uh, you know, banks like like discipline. They like financial rigor. They like budgets. They like uh, analysis of actual uh, versus versus budget. Um, you know, where do you start? I mean, have your controller do the the next uh, monthly cash, um, and then go back afterward and see where where the mistakes or the the inaccuracies were. If it was just an unplanned event, that's fine. If it was uh, an obvious cash outflow that should have been planned for, that that's a little different. Um, 
when you when you get better at it, I think you could include scenario analyses. What's going to happen if our demand goes up by 10%? Um, do we need additional financing for our working capital requirements? Um, what happens if uh, we have uh, we have to replace a number of workers and pay recruiting fees, th these types of things. The scenario analyses are often uh, very helpful because there's not just one uh, course of action. But never too late to start. And just to add to that, I, I would say, I think during COVID-19, Peter and I have been uh, most involved with our clients uh, around budgets, forecasts, and business plans. So. You know, I, I really encourage you um, to reach out to your advisor, your financial advisor, your your accountant, and, and ask them because they, they do a lot of these, and uh, that's the easiest way to start. I think I just saw uh, a question about this validation uh, <laughs> pop up, uh, but uh, maybe, maybe we'll get to that one as well. So industries. What industries do you expect uh, to have the largest contraction consolidation? Is there a risk for uh, any monopolies to be created? Will there be a downside for consumers? Well, those are great. Uh, those are great questions. Uh, largest contraction. Well, I think if you just read the news, it's um, our poor aviation sector. Uh, it's a. It's a. It's been a chronic problem for decades. It's a high fixed cost uh, business, um, similar to hotels. I think hotels, you know, if you don't have 60% occupancy, you might be losing money. Uh, and then, you know, seat occupancy in the airlines, it's a much higher percentage than that. Um, that is really tough. Um, is our government going to let um, there be consolidation in that industry? And then we have monopolistic pricing power? Probably not. But yeah, there's going to be some serious issues with that sector for many years. Uh, risk of monopolies, I think our antitrust laws um, will prevent that. Uh, downside for consumers? Um, I mean, I would say the downside is, you know, perhaps workers and employees. Look what's happening with, with the Amazon employees. Look what's happening to uh, the delivery workers that deliver our Uber Eats or Fedora, or I guess Fedora is leaving. Leaving. Look what happened with Fedora. We saw that um, leaving Canada because the workers had the right to unionize and they just left Canada, uh, leaving the market to non-unionized uh, service companies. Uh, I would say the downside for consumers, I mean, we're, we're the ones choosing the, the, the price and, and the source of the, 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 the products that we use, I would say the downsides more of the uh, lower lower wage workers in our country. Yeah, I, I would add also retail to that. I mean, retail would be a, an industry as well that is, has been hit very hard. And I think the other, in terms of consolidation, I think what's going to continue, as we said early on, look at some of the industries where there's going to be a larger succession, things like, you know, auto dealerships, uh, you know, auto parts manufacturing. There's going to be a, a, a lot of manufacturing industries in Ontario specifically are going to see a, a quite a bit of consolidation, and that's going to be moving a lot quicker now as a result of uh, COVID-19. Uh, just a one follow-up question. What about uh, the creative industries or entertainment industries, which I, I know certain certain pockets of uh, of the economy are heavy reliance on, whether Vancouver or Toronto or Montreal? Any any um, any uh, uh, perspective on there? Yeah, that's yeah. that's a, that's a sector I've covered a bit. That's a really mm -hmm. interesting one. So here we're in a time of lockdown, streaming, uh, Netflix Netflix subscriptions going through the roof. Um, a big demand for content, yet we're locked down. There's no active uh, film or TV uh, show production shooting right now. Um, a lot of the, the linear broadcasters need their new content that traditionally comes out in the fall. I think, I think what's going to happen is we've got all this demand for these TV show productions, and just when everything reopens, imagine you're going to have 18 months of, of production that has to happen in a 12-month period. It's going to be very difficult. Um, I'd love to own a, a studio space right now and be able to rent it out over the next 12 months. Um, 
I think the, the, the supply demand, I mean, you know, we always go to supply demand. There's not going to be enough uh, supply of uh, space and the technical people that are needed to, to film and produce. Um, those prices are going to go up and it's going to be, uh, you know, they're not, it's going to be more expensive, I think, to, to produce content as we emerge, at least in right, so, the first year or so. So lots of reruns of Murdoch Mysteries in the near future then. <laughs> I suppose if we can't get that new season out there. I think, Patrick, the other industry we need to keep a very close eye on, uh, as we always do, is real estate, right? We, you know, what th that drives not only our economy, but most economies. And, um, you know, there's going to be potentially some, some assets on the market um, uh, that people are going to take advantage of uh, as well. The, as everyone knows, the construction industry is, has not stopped, right? It's been continuing. But what happens when they, they close all the deals that are active now and people, uh, what happens in two, three, four, five months, uh, will there be the same demand for some of those house, housing starts? So that, that'll be yeah. something we need to follow closely. Do you see a divergence on real estate, a divergence between uh, commercial and uh, residential demand? Well, I, I can tell you that right now, commercial construction has, if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, has stopped, and residential has not. That's continue. I think that uh, you know, residential, depending on where the the, the build the builders are, um, I think the demand will continue, especially outside of the big city. Uh, I think that uh, commercial buildings, um, again, will continue. I don't believe it's going to have the same demand as it was pre-COVID-19, but I, again, I'm just guessing right now. I don't know. I, I'm not, not going to pretend to be a real estate expert. I mean, Peter might have a different perspective. No, I think, yeah, it's all speculative right now, but if you think about it, um, I think many companies are, are pleasantly surprised at how effective their virtual workforce has been during this time. Uh, Damien and I and, and our, our group of our team members, I mean, we've been working from home since uh, March 19, Damien, something around there. Yeah, that's correct. And, it, and, it, and it's quite incredible. And then you sort of ask yourself, we have, we have some team members that may have a 90 minute commute into downtown Toronto, you know, two ways, that's three hours. You know, are they working during those three hours? No. Um, do they need to come in every day? And if they don't, do we need as much space as we have? Um, so definitely a, a bit of a reset and maybe, Maybe we were getting to this, but I think this this might sort of leapfrog the transition that would have otherwise been natural over a longer period of time. Maybe it's going to happen in a shorter period of time. And just a quick comment on your your link to residential properties. I think uh, certainly in downtown Toronto, um, a high link, of course, to employment. We've got to keep people employed. Uh, if the renters don't have jobs, then they don't rent. Um, there's a link there. Uh, and, and, and renter is heavily, uh, heavily based in the services uh, sector, so uh, could, exactly. uh, challenging times, yeah. Exactly, challenging uh, times. So, uh, so it looks like we've got uh, two government-related questions here. I don't know if you guys can – you're certainly not here to speak for the government, but I think this is more about uh, input on. So do you anticipate government financial support will in, uh, will – create advantages or disadvantages for M&A? And do you anticipate the government to exercise more willingness to reject deals under the Investment Canada Act? Um, I think uh, there was a ministerial statement uh, last month uh, specifically related to uh, health and other PPE-based uh, uh, based industries or your thoughts? I, I can touch quickly on the first one. Do you anticipate the government financial support would create advantages or disadvantages in the M&A? Well, the, my understanding uh, is the reason for the government support was to get businesses that were healthy before COVID-19, have suffered during COVID-19, to get them back to where they were. So I, I think it can only help. I, I, I'm not sure how it could be a disadvantage. If you're, you're helping companies stay where they are, you know, make sure they get back on board. Will everybody get back on back to where they were? I, um, you know, the, depending on the industry. But I think that definitely help companies, whether they're buying or selling, uh, uh, more so than being a disadvantage in the M&A world. Yeah, yeah, I agree, because even if, let's say a company was failing anyway, 
and the government has provided it with financial support. So all we've really done was delay the failing of that enterprise. I think with what we just experienced, that 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 would be worth it. Um, the, the the additional pain of having a company fail over the last few months has probably outweighs the the government support that was put in there. Um, create advantages. Well, well, you know, I hope I hope it does. Um, you know, the, we knew the strategy was try to stick the employees to the to the the employers, and I think that that was a great. Uh, you know, that's the time to do it. In terms of M and A. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully neutral. Um, we we hear the we read the headlines that oh well this this subsidy wasn't wasn't great because it didn't uh, it didn't allow me to take advantage of it whereas other people did. So yes, n nothing, no subsidy can ever be perfect. And with the speed in which these subsidies were created, um, yeah, there's going to be some if you if you say losers, uh, they weren't entitled to it, and others who maybe should not have had the benefit that they that they did get and, and they will have gotten it. Um, but it certainly will distort the market. I think we have to acknowledge that. Your, your second question, Patrick, uh, or the second question, uh, you know, do we anticipate more government interaction? I, the, historically, we've seen government interaction on larger deals, uh, not the smaller, uh, you know, work that Canada thrives in the mid market, you know, the 50 to 150 million, $200 million deal. But you know, I, I think that the way I would answer this, I think buyers and buyers are going to take a different pers sorry sellers are going to take a different perspective on who they sell to. Um, I think you know we've gone through uh, a time now where we relied really the the world relied heavily on one area for supply, and it, we've seen the impact of that. I I think that we as consumers are going to start thinking about where the products we buy, where are they coming from? Uh, and I think that we said, as we said earlier on in the presentation, I think manufacturing in North America, the US and Mexico, I think is gonna uh, thrive from this. I think there's gonna be a lot more production coming back here. And I think there's gonna be a lot more transactions within, within the countries here. Um, but you know, I don't know how you stop foreign investment unless there's, as Peter said, there's some kind of issue with the uh, with the way that things are uh, transacting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, great. And uh, you know, we've got to uh, see if we can get two more questions in before uh, our time runs out for this uh, for this uh, dialogue today. Um, are there any are there any policies uh, need, that need to change to enable M and A so that recovery can go quickly and businesses do not burn as much time and resources on regulatory compliance? I'll make sure I take notes on your answer with this one. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say I think they should they should they should implement the policies that they have to hire us to do the work. I mean that would be uh, number one <laughs> policy. But I, I don't think, look, I, I, I don't, not sure how government's going to implement the policy to create m and I mean, you know, I, I, maybe they, there could be some kind of funding for m and activity in terms of, you know, Canadian companies. I really don't see how that's going to be implemented. I think it's more about getting the cash flow, the balance sheet strong, and through these subsidies and these loans, it's going to help the m and activity. I, re I really think it's going to be an indirect uh, uh, policies that are going to help m a activity. Great, and uh, looks like uh, here's another sectoral question uh, about um, uh, do we expect uh, large companies or even mid companies? Um, uh, do we see that there's might be a potentially significant push for uh, their digital transformation to be executed through you know uh, m a opportunities specifically in the AI? Thoughts? I mean, as 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 we said earlier, like the the working virtually, there there are some a lot of merits to that, and I don't think uh, Canadian businesses have harvested those merits yet. Um, one thing, you know, with with the advantage comes the disadvantage. The disadvantage we have a lot of clients right now who are struggling with their cyber security uh, risks, um, malware. Um, 
ransomware, those different risks. I mean, it just, you know, all of a sudden everybody's working virtually, perhaps home networks, and then home networks are, are traditionally not as secure as business networks. Um, if I think of, I think uh, I might be wrong, but government didn't the government of Ontario allow the um, witnessing of wills uh, to be done digitally now for the very first time? Uh, I think there is going to be a big push of AI and virtual and digital transformation, and certainly it will open up uh, some different areas of, of profit and therefore M&A opportunities. Because if we go back to what, what our, our theory is, is that with rapid change comes a requirement to rapidly change valuations, how things are appreciated, and there's ebbs and flows, things that three months ago weren't uh, as valuable or more valuable today, and then the reverse is true in other industries. Great. Um, you know, is uh, just before we wrap up, uh, uh, Peter, Damien, do you have any uh, concluding thoughts? Uh, or I'll, I'll kick it off, Peter. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I think that um, actually timing is the uncertain here. I think everyone with their businesses uh, need to make sure that they understand what their cash flow needs are today and in, in the next little while. Uh, as Peter had said, you know, we need to put different scenarios in place. You know, you do, you know, best worst case scenarios. We are telling companies uh, that we talk to, you know, you probably should be pulling together scenarios and forecasts of four to nine months down the road and see what kind of impact that has. Uh, on your cash flow, really focus on your cash flow. Cash is king, as we said earlier, uh, and and really take advantage of those those government programs and subsidies. And and uh, as I mentioned earlier, communication is very important with all your stakeholders. They're here to help. They're not here to hurt you. Uh, everyone's in the same position. So make sure you communicate uh, with with your stakeholders. And and again, it's not a plug. But I, I really want to stress that you have advisors like Peter and I and others out there that do this all the time. We, Peter and I have been doing this for a long time. Please reach out to us and, and, and talk to us. We're, we're happy to take a call and tell you what we think. Peter? Yeah, I'll pick it up from there. So, uh, yeah, I want to stress relationships with your key vendors. Absolutely critical. Um, if, if you are in one of those sectors with a rapid reemergence, you probably won't be able to deal with all the demand coming your way. Um, be selective. Choose to work with those uh, customers that have been with you uh, for a long time and under fair conditions. Um, also, if you're a, a private business owner, maybe this is the time where you could think of some um, Tax strategies. If if you if you have some family trusts and you want to do some estate freezing, there are some advantages in a period where perhaps there's been a drop in valuations. You can have capital gains and things accrue to the next generation or the family trust. Um, you know, let's let's not let a you know let's not let a good pandemic go to waste. A good a good recession go to waste. Um, there are things that we can do. We take the best out of the environment that we're in. Uh, we move forward, we plan, and uh, we all get better. Yeah, well stated. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, Damien, for joining us today and for giving us uh, your insights on on where you think we're going and what's happening behind the scenes with so many uh, Canadian businesses uh, today uh, and your clients. Um, your knowledge and insight and experience greatly appreciate. My big takeaway is that planning is key, and with all of us at home, you know, having those sitting down maybe for the first time, especially if you're a small business, and thinking about what what the future might be and, and being a little more proactive on planning, uh, talking to your your business partners, whether it's your your uh, accountant or lawyer or or, or banker, um, you know they're there they're they're stuck at home too, and so if you're waiting for your call, and they're happy to sort of help you work through some thoughts. But uh, planning is key, and uh, I hope I I'd just like to thank everyone for joining this call today, and I hope that you, you found it valuable. And uh, uh, stay tuned; uh, there will be more even more uh, support and tools. Uh, being stood up very, very soon uh, from different channel partners uh, to help you sort of work through the different uh, different and fast-paced decisions that you're making uh, during this time. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today for this uh, business support webinar series, and I hope you can uh, join the next one uh, later on this week. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Be safe.